A major win in the war against ISIS, American drone strikes taking out the top terror leader in Afghanistan. This as the new U.S. military commander takes over in that region next weekend. So what should we expect? Joining us now is international relations expert Dr. Rebecca Grant. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. So um, we have now three of the top guys killed in the last two years. What should we expect moving forward with the U.S., uh, a new leader coming here for the U.S. military starting this weekend? Right. Our strategy in Afghanistan is to try to hit the Taliban and ISIS remnants hard enough to make them negotiate. So I expect to see a continued heavy use of air power. There were 746 airstrikes carried out in July, and that is more than we've seen in about a five-year period. So that's very important to go forward. And with the new commander, uh, General Miller is someone who's very experienced in Afghanistan. He was on the ground in Mogadishu in 1993, leading the rescue efforts after Black Hawk Down. So this is a real expert in counterinsurgency and in training Afghanistan's forces. Yeah. Uh, doctor, this is a, a huge problem we've had for years now. It, it makes you wonder why there was such reluctance to use this kind of force in the previous administration. It was a growing problem, a growing threat. They captured a lot of land uh, because of kind of a, a failure to really take them seriously. What was that reluctance, do you think? Right. There was an attempt to draw down forces in Afghanistan, and the change that we saw about this time last year is a mini-surge using tactics bringing our advisors closer to the actual fight to try to help Afghanistan's forces control more of that territory. Air power is a leading part of that with surveillance and the strikes backing up the special operations forces working there. So I think what we see is President Trump very reluctant, but he doubled down to try to make the strategy work to try to bring all the warring parties into some form of negotiation. That hasn't happened yet, but that is still our strategy. I want to move on to North Korea. Uh, they're blasting, saying, uh, doubling down the U.S. after President Trump pulls the plug on Pompeo's trip. Where do things stand with denuclearization now? Because we know the meeting back in June seemed to go really well, and then there's been kind of this just gridlock of nothing really happening, both parties just kind of stopping there. Right. Perfect question, Jackie. And I think that denuking is still on track, but the railroad engine has stopped. North Korea says that they have destroyed a nuclear test site, taken apart some missile testing equipment, and of course returned some remains. So now they want some concessions. But what Trump and Pompeo and Secretary Mattis are saying is you've got to do more. We need to see some real progress towards denuclearization, and that would be an inventory of the weapon sites, letting in inspectors, bringing out some spent fuel rods, some things that they have not yet been willing to do. Big sticking yeah. points include a peace treaty and North Korea's security guarantees. Is the administration idealizing the potential of this? I mean, it sure seems like this would be almost unimaginable if you got Kim Jong-un to really cooperate with something like this, because I don't think it has his best interests at heart. If he wants to retain power of this you know, country for the rest of his life and keep this regime in place, you know, how does he win here, I guess is my question. Great question, Rob. And, you know, Kim Jong-un has a unique opportunity to reach out for some economic development. And as our commander in Korea, General Brooks, says, there is no going back for North Korea. The U.N. Security Council is still locked arms. Kim needs and wants some sanctions relief. So going forward is the only thing. But President Trump told us back in May it will go as slowly or as quickly as Kim Jong-un wants. It's about the political will in Kim Jong-un's heart, as our charge aid affairs there said. So it really is on his shoulders. We have yet to see. We have to keep the pressure on military and right. the sanctions pressure. Yeah. And Dr. Grant, uh, lastly, John McCain's lasting impact on our military as he passed this weekend. A lot of thoughts on him this morning. Uh, what would you say about his impact on our military? As a national security analyst, John McCain was a Navy man through and through. Naval aviation, he could be really tough on the Air Force. He made sure it was always an admiral in command in the Pacific. But under his time in the Senate, naval aviation flourished. They got the new Super Hornet fighter, the P-8 surveillance plane, and he set U.S. Navy aviation up for the radical new F-35 stealth fighter. His legacy in U.S. naval aviation, that's what I think of. Navy man through and through. Yeah, his legacy in so many different parts of this country, so many different places on so many people. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.